Let's just ask the Lord to bless this time. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you that we get to jump back into Matthew and to continue on the journey you've been taking us through your word, through the truths of it. Lord, I pray you'd speak to us and I pray that you would convict us. And Lord, I pray that we would not be offended by your word so much as be in a place of humility under it. And I just pray especially today that as we talk about being faithful in a time that is hard to be faithful in, I pray that we would be convicted to the heart as your followers. We thank you for this, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Kentwood, I'm happy to be here this morning to uh, preach the Word of God to you once again after being apart for some time. Uh, while I was locked away for the past almost month, I had a lot of time to kind of reflect on God and His Word and on what He's doing right now in the world, and I kept on being reminded that He has a purpose in all of this, that as Christians, it's probably not appropriate for us to be in a place of complaining or whining uh, because God has a purpose in these hardships. He, he tells us over and over again in Scripture about that. But I also found myself most frustrated. You know, somebody said, weren't you mad at the government being locked away for a month? And I said, no, I wasn't mad at the government at all. In fact, what I was most frustrated was uh, about the fact that I could not be here with you and I could not be serving in the role that God has called me to. That was my biggest frustration. So I'm grateful to be back uh, in the pulpit this morning, ready as much as you are to come under the word that God has for us. Uh, before our two-week break, we had been looking at the second coming of Christ. Uh, we're going to continue through Matthew, at least up to before Christmas, and then we'll have a couple specific uh, sermons on our Christmas season, but I wanted to just continue on. And we've been looking at the second coming of Christ in Matthew 23 and 24. We're going to continue looking at that today, and I think we're going to find the application today to be incredibly uh, challenging to us in our current hour and situation we find ourselves in. I want to ask you this morning a question uh, that is really thrust into our faces again and again and again in this chapter and in the chapter to come. Um, it's the one that Jesus keeps throwing into our faces as we go into this uh, chapter. And the question is this, are you ready for the return of Christ? Are you ready for the return of Christ? Christ says in no uncertain terms, he will be coming back at a time and an hour that we do not know. And the question is, are you ready to meet him? If he came back today, Right now, would you feel that your life has been lived in such a way that you're glad to see him, that you get down on your knees and worship him, or would you be afraid of what he may be thinking of you? There are three clear thoughts that come from our passage today. Number one, that the return of Christ to gather his elect, as we saw in verse, uh, chapter 23, is still coming. Uh, number two, that we do not know the day or hour that this will occur. And number three, we must watch and be ready for his coming because the faithful servant will be received and the wicked one, it says in our passage, is going to be judged. And so there's this strong kind of three-parter to this, right? The return of Christ is coming. Uh, we don't know when that's going to be and uh, we must watch and be ready. It comes out again and again and again. And indeed, the Bible says, he that stands firm till the end will be saved. That's Matthew 10, 22. So, can you say today that you are indeed standing firm? And when Christ returns, will you be standing firm? Or, dear Lord, have mercy on us. Will some of us be found to have a faith that is easily broken in hardship? My friends, about half of Matthew chapter 24 deals with signs that are not signs of the coming of Christ, right? We talked about these signs that were actually just normal things that were going to happen in our world, patterns in our world. A very small section deals with actual return of Christ, okay? That's verses 27 to 31. But did you know that a third of Matthew 24 and all of chapter 25, a total of 62 verses, talks about us getting ready and being watchful for the return of Christ? 
So the overwhelming emphasis of these words from Christ are not on the signs of his return, as we often put our emphasis on, but the overwhelming emphasis on Christ is is not on the date of his return, but on the position of our hearts and our minds and on the position of our spiritual walk towards the truth of his return. It's about are we ready and watching being watchful, being ready. And so as we enter into this section of Scripture today, I want to ask you, are you ready? That's what's asked of us. Are you ready? If you have your Bibles, I want you to please turn with me to Matthew 24. We're going to read 36 through 51. And just let us read the Holy Word of God together and hear from Him on this. So Matthew 24, starting in verse 36, says... But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken, one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom this master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed, And begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards. The master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So if you remember back, the question that started all of this, way back at the start, All of this teaching from Christ about his second coming was the question from the disciples, when will all these things take place, right? You remember that question. And it seems here we have come full circle because after Christ tells them what will happen and what to watch for and what his coming will look like, he ends by saying, but of the day and the hour, no one knows. He answers their question now. Verse 36, not even the angels or the sun meaning Jesus himself knows the day or the hour. Only the Father knows the exact day or hour of Christ's return. You know, it's been a fool's errand over the years uh, who have tried to guess the time of Christ's second coming. So far, it's a 100% failure rate. They've not got it. If the angels and Jesus himself does not know when he will return, how foolish to think that we know when he will return. Now, you might be saying in response to this too, you might have looked at this and said, how is it that Jesus cannot know when his return is going to be? Isn't he God? Well, the answer is, of course, he's God, but he's also human. Uh, The great mystery of the incarnation of Christ uh, is that Jesus is 100% God and he is 100% man. And in his humanness, he had limits. Uh, He got tired. He uh, got hungry. He learned. He grew, he got stronger, and so he was in some sense still this fragile human being, a baby who would have been cold in the manger. And yet we saw, like at the transfiguration, that he was also the infinite God of all creation. Could Jesus have taken up this knowledge? Could he have uh, taken up this knowledge of the exact day or hour that he was coming back? Yeah, I believe he could have. I believe he could have. But he chose not to. And I think there's a good reason for it. Why would Jesus not just take up that knowledge and tell us? Well, there's a good reason why he did not share such knowledge with us. Because I think there's a a problem that we have as people. I think in our sinfulness, we would abuse it if we knew it. 
I really believe that. If we knew that Jesus was coming back December 10th, 2021, then it's likely that many of us would live however we wanted in whatever sinful state we wanted until December 9th, 2021, and then we'd make things right again. We would squander our time until that day and sin freely. We would procrastinate with our souls. We would not make right with God until the last moment, and we would be simply self-serving, I think, in that regard. We would squander that time. Rather, what our passage here is teaching us is that God wants us to live in a place where we do not know when he will return, and thus we're always ready, always on our toes. God wants us to live in a prepared state because we don't know when he will come back. It's much better for us. It's better for our diligence, for our faithfulness. It's to keep us alert and awake, to keep us looking up at all times and in all situations, to be ready for his return. You know, I was a terrible student in school uh, because I always procrastinated until the very last moment on assignments and on tests. You know, I never studied until the night before uh, a test. I didn't even study, I don't think, for almost any of my grade 12 exams. I didn't study once. I think I may have opened a book for a couple hours. That was it. And, And yet I still passed with respectable marks. And my mother used to always say to me, you know, imagine if you actually applied yourself, Garrett. (laughs) Imagine if you actually studied and went ahead and got prepared beforehand. Imagine what you could have accomplished. But all of this was uh, because I knew when the test was, I knew when the assignment was due, uh, I would procrastinate. I'd rather do other things than do that. But you know what changed that behavior? Pop quiz. The pop quiz came along for me in, I think, grade eight or nine, and I remember coming to my first pop quiz, and it instilled so much fear into me uh, of knowing that at any moment my teacher could call a pop quiz. And so in, in that, I, I studied and I was diligent around that because I just didn't know when the pop quiz was going to come. And so in the same sense, I think we as Christians, we live faithfully under the reality that at any moment the role could be called up yonder. At any moment, he could return. And we must be ready and watching. So are you ready? Are you watching? You know, I think we hear this message before and we kind of, at first, glob onto it. And then as we go along, we kind of drift away from the reality. And then we have to be reminded and come back to this truth and this reality. So, are you watching? Are you ready? To illustrate this need to be ready, Christ employs a few examples for us. Firstly, the example of the days of Noah. That's the first thing he brings up. Jesus says in verse 38, like in the days of Noah will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So the idea here is that when it comes, first of all, it's gonna be sudden, The floodwaters in Noah's time came on in an instant. You know, despite the many years of warning from Noah, the people would not listen to him. They would not take notice of his calls to repentance. Second Peter calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. And so I have no doubt in my mind that Noah was warning the people of coming wrath and of the present need for repentance to get on the ark, you know, despite all that uh, nobody listened Nobody listened. And so for them, the flood just came suddenly. It came upon them in an instant. They weren't expecting it. They weren't ready for it. It just came upon them. This is how it will be with Christ's return. It will be unexpected by many. And I think the point is that it should not be so with us, brothers and sisters. It shouldn't be that case with us. We shouldn't be in a place of, oh, man, I never saw it coming. We should be in a place where we're ready. Now, it's still going to throw us to our knees. It's still going to throw us in awe of God when Jesus comes back. But we're not going to be hopefully caught off guard. We should live in the expectation of his coming, and that should change the way we live. That should change the way we do our day-to-day life. The second point here from Noah is that, from Noah is that he will con- come in a time where people will be in a place of not caring, not believing, You know, it's interesting, you know, the days of Noah, it says people's thoughts were continually sinful all the time. 
And you know, as we've walked through Matthew 24, it's been pretty clear that the, the time of Christ's coming is going to be a pretty awful time. There's going to be uh, horrible things that we're all going to be facing. And, but this is a time when people will not be caring, not believing in his return. A time when people are not looking up, but only down at the earth, at the affairs of their life. As it says here, people will be eating and drinking and giving in marriage. Now, real quick, you might say, well, what's wrong with eating and drinking and giving in marriage? That sounds very nice. We should all be doing that. Some people here are preparing to give in marriage. And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong in and of themselves, but if that's the end in and of themselves... And we're not looking towards the eternal thing, then uh, we're we're in a place that we shouldn't be. They were so distracted by the cares of their life, so inundated by what they were what they see here, that they never looked up nor gave a care for the spiritual, never gave a care for what God had in store for them. And there's a great danger that even we as Christians need to be aware of, and that is when we get so focused on the things of this world that we're distracted away from our gaze on the eternal things, uh, we find ourselves in a place where we're not ready. All our comforts, all our jobs, our family plans, our materialism has the danger of lulling us into indifference. Christ will come back as we sweetly drink our fancies, as one person said it. This will be the world's approach to the last days. And you know what? We're seeing that, by the way, even now. You know, people say, I'm going into quarantine. Just give me a bottle of wine and some Cheetos. I'll sit in front of the TV and do my thing. That's how people respond. They're responding to that now. I'm not saying it's the end of days. Maybe it is. We should be ready. But the point is, that's how people take this time. We're going to eat, drink, just carry on. No thought towards greater things that could be happening in our time. No thought to the spiritual, to God, uh, to love, to duty. And so there's no reason why we, though, this is the, he's talking to his disciples. There's no reason why we should be like the crowd in this. In Noah's day, people were so busy with all their plans and comforts and enjoyments of life that they never feared any alteration of it. This is never going to change. We're just going to get up tomorrow and blah, blah, blah. No, this could change in an instant. This could change tonight. This could change tomorrow. This could change after church is over. Are we faithful? Are we ready? Are we making the most of what God has called us to do? And the warning to us is that this can all change in an instant, unlike the uncaring, unbelieving people of Noah's day. We need to be watching and we need to be ready. And one of the great discouragements that I feel is that so many Christians have forgotten to look up in the midst of our current situation we are in. We're so distracted by COVID that we've lost sight of what matters. And this is what does, and this, and this, what does faithfulness and duty to God look like right now? That's what we should be asking. What does faithfulness and our duty to God look like right now? And this warning from Christ is being said to us, his followers, a warning that we are not like those in the days of Noah. Are we ready? Are we preoccupied? John Ryle said it best. He said, the world will not be converted when Christ returns. Millions of professing Christians will be found thoughtless, unbelieving, godless, Christless, worldly, and unfit to meet their judge. That's the warning are we ready? We can't just say because I go to church or I come from a Christian family that I am, in, I am ready to meet the Lord. It comes down to what is, what is your relationship with Christ look like? What does it look like right now? Are you ready? Will you be one who perishes in the judgment or will you be ready and watching when the Lord returns? Next, in verses 40 to 41, Jesus makes the point of saying that when he comes, there will be also sudden separation. Uh, Two will be working in the field, one will be taken, one will be left behind. That repeats itself more than once there. Now, there's been a debate as to what that exactly means. Does this refer to a judgment? One will be separated to judgment, the other to everlasting life? Or does this speak of Jesus coming to gather his elect from the earth? As we read in Matthew 24, 31, the angels will come like with the four winds and gather the elect of the earth uh, to himself, right? We'll meet Jesus in the air together. We read that as well. One will be taken, the other will be left behind. Uh, I would say that that is 
the latter is more likely here because of the context. This is a picture of Jesus coming and gathering his people to himself. And it says, one will be taken, one will be left behind. And so what we need to understand from this and what we must hear is this, no one will be saved because you are close or related to another person who knows Jesus. You will not be saved because your mom or dad is saved. You will not be saved because your spouse is saved. You must believe in Christ yourself. You must have the relationship with Christ. You must be forgiven by Christ. You must put your trust in his payment for sin. No one can do it for you. Proximity to someone else who is a really, really faithful person in Christ is not going to do it. If you put your hope in that fact, then you are, that you are part of a Christian family, then you are in danger of being left behind. You must believe in Christ yourself. This also reminds us that the belief of universalism, which is that uh, all will one day be saved because Christ is so incredibly loving, is a lie. There will be a separation of believers from non-believers. And when he comes, there will be a dividing of those who have put their faith in Christ and those who have not. This is supposed to be unsettling. It's not supposed to be, oh, that's interesting. No, it's unsettling to imagine the thought that Christ, when he comes to gather his people, my wife could go and I'll be left behind. I need to make sure I put my faith in Christ. So, because he will come suddenly, like the days of Noah, because he will come unexpectedly to separate those who believe from those who do not believe, Jesus says in verse 42, therefore, stay awake Stay awake. You do not know the day or the hour, so stay awake, Christian. Do not fall asleep spiritually. Do not be lulled into apathy. And what does it mean to fall asleep spiritually? You take a step back. I'm not going to be praying. I'm not going to be reading my Bible. My faith is squandered. It fizzles. Uh, I'm not living for Christ. I'm not... Uh, looking for the opportunity to serve Christ, I just fall asleep and just kind of roll with the punches of this life and just carry on. And Christ has no impact on how we live. We fall asleep. He says, stay awake. Do not be lulled into apathy. Do not be delivered into indifference. Do not be given over to passivity. Do not say, I will be faithful another day. You may not have another day. Do not say that I will wait until things are easier. Things may not get easier. Do not say I will serve the Lord faithfully when we're back to COVID normal, before COVID and back to normal. There may not be a normal. You may not have time to wait. And so Jesus says now is the time. Do not fall asleep now. Do not be indifferent now. What do we do now? I see so many willing to sit back during COVID and coast. The church has a, a danger right now of coasting. Um, you may not have time to coast. Oh, God, be gracious to us if he returns during COVID and finds us coasting, sitting on our couches, eating Doritos without a care in the world for the world that is falling apart and the people who are perishing in their sins and suffering in our day. We can't let ourselves fall asleep in, you know, in the early church, in AD 165, there was a devastating epidemic that struck the Roman world under the reign of Marcus Aurelius. And whilst people, and this literally happened, people who were family members would take their sick people because they were so afraid and just throw them out into the street and leave them. They would just take like their family members and just toss them out into the street and leave the bodies laying there just to die. No one to care for them. No one to try to even help them come back to health. And you know what the Christians did? They rose to the occasions. Not only did they treat their own sick, their own family members who were sick, they would go out and they'd take those people that were thrown into the streets and bring them into their home and they would nurse them and try to bring them back to health in their own homes. 
It, 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 you can read, there's actually a, a governor's letter written to uh, Caesar saying, this is what the Christians are doing. Not only are they looking after their own sick, they're going out into the streets and pulling the sick into their houses and looking after them. And it's said that at the time, some have speculated that they may have saved, Christians may have saved up to two-thirds of the people infected because they cared for them. They were willing to care for them. And I just see a picture of Christians who were willing to put down their lives to save others. And I just think, well, what happened? <laughs> what happened to us? Well, where is our willingness to risk for the sake of the gospel and for love's sake? Are we awake or have we fallen asleep? I want to agree with Calvin's words. Our call to stay awake calls us to such continuous attention to his imminent return that it should make us walk like pilgrims on the earth with minds on the alert. What God wants in his people are watchmen. Watchmen. In verses 43 to 44, Jesus uses the example of a man sitting up all night to catch the thief who is coming to rob him. But he does not know when this will occur, and so he just stays awake and waits for him to come so he can catch him. There are many passages that compare Christ's return to a thief in the night. And again, asking us, uh, asking us not to be caught sleeping when he comes. Boyce rightly pointed this out. He says, we spend money on home alarms and on uh, car alarms. We spend money on all those things. We sometimes spend money on shotguns and shovels and the traditional Ralph Kleinian philosophy of home defense, <laughs> all to protect the value of our property. But how much is your soul worth? We would stay up all night to catch a thief breaking into our home. How much is the gospel worth? Would we be able to spend the same amount of effort to be on the alert just as much in the pursuit of holiness and righteousness and evangelism? Are we ready for when the Son of Man comes like a thief in the night? Are we alert in the same fashion? Jesus is using this analogy, that we'd be alert as if a robber was about to break into our home. Are we alert? And so what does it mean to be ready? Again, I defer to Boyce, who says it so well. It means loving Jesus. It means trusting Jesus. It means waiting for Jesus. It means the faithful servant is, is so because he's expecting the Lord's return and thus he carries out faithful service, continuing in the duty that Jesus has left us to do in this world. And so here's the big question that Jesus asks, verse 45 to 47, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over the household to give them their food in the proper time. Who here today, as we sit under the reading of God's word, is the faithful servant? Are you a faithful servant? Are you awake or are you asleep? Are you standing ready to serve Jesus or are you sitting back? COVID has caused a lot of Christians to slink back into indifference and self protection. But as God looks over the earth, will he find us faithful? Do we get to push the pause button on the gospel? Do we get to do that just because we're in a pandemic? Do we get to go pause? Gospel can wait. Church can wait. Do we get to push the pause on the mission that we are, are on? Can we push pause on our worship and discipleship? Can we push pause on our fellowship and I'm not talking here about bucking the rules that the government's putting down. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking, do we, am I, am I trying to be in a place where our, my heart's position is where I will not give up on those things, about fulfilling our call in any way we can, to call, to write, to phone, to email, to read, to pray, to share, to love, and above all else, not to fall asleep not to slink back into passivity. How do we practice fellowship in a time when we're not allowed to be in each other's homes? Pick up the phone, call someone, pray with them, email them, write them a note to encourage them. Think about the people in our church who you haven't talked to for a while. Give them a shout, give them a call. You have people you might be working next to. Uh, there's your mission field. 
There's your mission field. Think about ways that you can be a witness to them. We can't just push pause. And when it comes to the worship of Christ, whether we get to gather here like this or whether you're at home on a Sunday because they close down churches, are you actually taking a Sunday morning with your family to read the word, to pray, to come under some teachings maybe off the internet or something we put out? Are you able to still do that? We can't slink back into passivity. We can't allow us just to go into a, a numbness. We got to keep pressing forward uh, and protect it at all costs. The household of God needs its servants. The body of Christ needs its body parts. Who is the faithful servant among us? We pray that when he comes, regardless of the situation, he will find us faithful. He will find us faithful. You know, this last week, you know, our church right now, we're pretty full today, but we're usually fuller. I have... Uh, heard from many folks, and some folks says, say, I won't come because there's too many restrictions. I don't want to wear a mask. Others say, I don't want to come because I'm afraid of COVID. Um, in both areas, I would just encourage people, uh, what is good for you? What is good for your soul? What is God asking you to do? I'm not going to make a judgment call on that right now, but it's a very important question. We can't allow uh, things to cause us to park back into passivity. We cannot fall back into being asleep or to be deterred by things that are going on. So, we pray that when he comes, regardless of the situation, he will find us faithful. Or, Jesus ends our passage by talking about being found to be like the wicked servant. And it's worth highlighting, just as a comparison, as a warning to us. Jesus describes him in verse 48 through 51. He says, But if that wicked servant says to himself, My master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour he does not know, and will cut him to pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so this wicked servant, he shows three distinct traits, and it's worth us highlighting really quick to judge ourselves with. Number one, he was careless. He neglected his work that was given to him. Why? Because he believed the master was far off from coming. How easy is it for us to say, well, I'll, I'll be faithful tomorrow because I think Jesus isn't coming back for a while. We can't do that. He thinks it will be a long time before the master returns, and so he disobeys him. He was careless in his work. He did not live with the imminent return of Christ in mind. And we should be warned that when we become lethargic and careless of our mission, we will become like the wicked servant in some ways, doing whatever we want rather than what the master has asked of us. Okay, that's important. Think about our time. Think about the debates that are going on. We want to do whatever we want and not what the master has asked of us. I get that sense of many people right now. They want, more about, they want more about what they want rather than what God wants. That's the ultimate question. Number two, the, this wicked servant showed cruelty. That cruelty marked this wicked servant. It says he began to what? Beat his fellow servants. He began to beat his fellow servants. I have not seen in my time as pastor Christians treating one another with such cruelty as I have seen in the last months of covid Christians in disunity, insulting one another, taking pot shots at one another's views on Facebook. It's just disrespectful towards each other and uncaring, cruel in some cases. The wicked servant beat their fellow servants with no sound sense of accountability to God who says that, there are, that, that we are to guard the unity we have in Christ. John says, if anyone hates their brother, then the love of Christ cannot be in them. We cannot be cruel servants to one another. We can't do that. We can't do that. I was so encouraged. I wasn't here, but I was encouraged to hear from Scott yesterday as I talked to him that there were many prayers and many verses shared at the last uh, meeting we had for a prayer service where people prayed for the unity of the body and uh, exhorted one another for that. Praise God. We got to continue in that vein. And finally, the wicked servant was carousing, which basically means he was partying, drinking it up. And he was uh, self-indulgent. 
self-seeking, not at all living as one who puts others above themselves or who carries their cross and loses their life for Christ's sake. It was a selfish person with no sense of what is good for the community. And I just think, boy, there's so many applications here. There's so many things we can take in about, about caring about the duty we have in Christ, about being loving to our brothers and sisters in Christ, and about being in a place uh, where we are not self-seeking right now, but caring about the community, caring about one another. Important aspects for us to take away from this. The one who lives expectant of the return of Christ feeds the body, cares for the body, carries out their duty with care and proper fear. But the one who lives thinking the master is far off can be in danger and prone to the wicked impulses of carelessness about the gospel, about the mission, and cruel towards others whom they serve with as selfishness takes hold. And the judgment of Christ is so firm here, we can't skip over it. It says, to that wicked servant, it says, he will come and cut him to pieces putting him where the hypocrites go. That cutting to pieces is a strong language. It's serious language. It's there to, to be over the top on purpose, to try to warn about the, the seriousness of those actions where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, anger, crying. And we understand this place to be hell. So this is no light warning from our Savior. So he warns us, be watchful, be ready, Seek salvation as it may be found today because we do not know the time or the hour that he is going to return. So as we come to the end, and I know this is a bit of a heavy message, are you ready? Are you ready? May I ask, what does the current time and hour we live in say about your readiness for the return of Christ? What does the current time and hour we live in say about your readiness for the return of Christ? What do our current circumstances and the way you respond to them say about the quality and measure of your faith? Has the current test that God has brought upon us given you any insight at all? It's a gift from God. Truly, it's a gift from God for us to walk through these things right, to walk through hardship that we may be honed in, sharpened, uh, brought close. The church, as I've said before, I believe is we're being kind of sifted and rattled. And this moment in time is so very mild compared to what is to come. This is simply a trial run for the church, as my wife said the other day, are we ready? Are we ready? And so just to end, to quote Boyce, there's an old fable which I think speaks well in which three apprentice devils come to Satan and ask and talk to him. And the first one says, I will tell the people there is no God. And Satan replied, that will not fool many because they know there is a God. The second devil said, I will tell them there is no hell. And Satan said, you'll never fool many with that one. They know there's a hell. And the third devil then said, I'll tell them that there's no hurry. And Satan said, go and you will ruin millions. The apathy, the being lulled into indifference, the belief that there is no hurry really puts us in a dangerous place as Christians where we don't fulfill our calling. We don't continue on. And I just think, like I said, we're living in a time where it would be easy to say, oh, I'm in quarantine. I'm just going to sit back and do nothing. That's easy. It's nice to have the break. Sure, it was uh, hard for Holly and I to be away for a month, but it was nice to have the break. <laughs> but we can't stay there. We can't stay in that place. So I ask again, even as Jesus asks over and over again in these chapters, are you ready for his return? First of all, are you saved? Do you know Jesus? Do you know him as Savior? Have you asked forgiveness for your sins and invited him into your life as Lord? Are you saved? Secondly, are you watching? Are you watching for his return? And thirdly, are you being faithful? Are you being faithful? Folks, I just want to maybe say one more thing. You are loved by God. 
And all these hard words, it'd be easy for us to think, well, if I'm not doing what God's called me to do, he must not like me. I don't want to say that. I want to say you are loved by God. And he loves the world enough to say to us, don't stop. Don't stop in the middle of COVID. Don't stop in whatever circumstances you find yourself in. Find whatever way you can, even as we bend over backwards to obey the government in everything we can. Don't stop the mission he sent you on. Don't let the church become become irrelevant in a time when we need to be most relevant. We cannot be there. We're in the Christmas season. What an opportunity we have to show people love at a hard time. May the Holy Spirit help us to live each day as pilgrims with eyes looking up, ready for our Savior's return. May we get to the end of the race, not be ashamed, but be grateful and say we ran hard. We finished the race. Because of God's grace in our life, we finished the race. Let's pray as the worship team comes up for one last song. Father, we ask for your help in this. We recognize that these are big words, but it is hard for us to live them apart from your power at work in our life. We need to wake up each day with the Holy Spirit reminding us of this truth. Holy Spirit, we need you to convict our hearts of this truth. We need you to come and and, uh, help us to know how to do these things well, how to be faithful, how to talk to our neighbor, um, how to traverse the landscape of this time we're in and still be effective as a body, how to reach out to our brothers and sisters who are in different places than us. And Lord, just continue to work in us, continue to drive us, and just give us the ability to wake up each day as so many have gone before us. Christians who have been missionaries and Christians who have loved you uh, in the service of you have gone each day with the expectation that they were going to see you maybe today face to face. May you give us that imperative as well, Lord, as we go into our weeks and months ahead. And we thank you, Lord, for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.